Okay, welcome everybody to our first session after uh, morning tea. Uh, and you're all on time, so come and have a sit down. Um, I'd just like to quickly introduce uh, Matt, but I don't really know how to introduce him because he told me he likes to remain a mystery. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, please welcome Matt McKegg. Chick, chick, we, we on? Sweet. Okay, how's it going? Um, yeah, so I, this is the first time I've ever given a talk in the, like before lunch, so I'm not usually awake right now. <laughs> so let's hope that coffee I didn't drink before like worked. So um, this is my project that I've been working on for the last five years. It is software for live electronic music performance that you can use with these devices. So why don't I just use Ableton? Um, because I'm a developer that, that has a very serious case of not invented hair syndrome. So I just find that like Ableton just doesn't quite ever do exactly what I want. So I know JavaScript. Why not like make it myself? So that's exactly what I did. I got some HTML, some CSS, some JavaScript, some web audio, some web MIDI, and Electron, and shoved it all in a great big blender, pushed the thing, waited five years, and now we've got an app. <laughs> so I think the best way for me to explain what Loop Drop does is to just like use it and play a song for you. But um, rather than me just making this an entirely um, personal thing where I'm up here pushing buttons and you guys are like, well, that's pretty nice and all, but I don't feel like I'm part of that. I would actually like to include you in the song I'm about to make. I would like to record some of your body parts making sounds, such as your feet and your hands and your voices. If that's all right with you, is that okay? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so for a start, I would like to get a nice big JavaScript. So can I get you all to stand up, if that's all right? Because you've got to have that. You've got to have like the really enthusiastic JavaScript. <laughs> All right. On three. Wait, like after three, I'll go one, two, three, and then beat. So one, two, three. JavaScript! Nice. It's JavaScript! JavaScript! One of the better JavaScripts I've got. <laughs> I'm not saying it's as good as like, I don't know, Melbourne were pretty good. They were, they were amazing. I'm just going to change my settings, because, oh no, that is off, okay. All right, let's get one more, just for good luck. One, two, three. JavaScript! That's really nice. JavaScript! JavaScript! All right, how about some really nice kick drums from your feet? So stomp your feet. And I'm going to stomp my feet because it probably won't pick you up very well, so it'll probably be mostly my foot. But you feel, you'll feel like you're taking fart. <laughs> On three. One, well, after three. One, two, three. Wow, that was nice. <laughs> it's pretty violent. <laughs> OK, does anyone know what a hi-hat sounds like? Yes. So same thing. One, two, three. So I'm just going to make it sound a bit more like a hi-hat. There we go. How's that? <laughs> and finally, a snare, but maybe just a clap, because snares are pretty hard noises to make. So uh, same thing again, and a clap. One, two, three. Nice. Can I get one single volunteer from the audience like you, Owen, to yell out, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah. All right. One, two, three. Yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah! And it's some effects. Yeah, 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 That's nice. Yeah, 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 yeah,
That's nice. All right, that's all I need from you, so you can sit down. Or you can stand up, come up the front and like... <laughs> so, um, as you may have noticed, uh, Loop Drop is a sampler. I can record people, and then I can do things with it. Um, but it's also a synthesizer. So, down here I've set up a bass. Uh, and I've also sampled an 808 kit up here earlier. And you may have noticed that you're hearing sounds playing, but I'm not actually like playing those sounds with my fingers. Like you're not seeing me going like, and that's why because it would sound like that. <laughs> so with the magic of time and maths and JavaScript uh, and other things. I have devised a strategy for making it so that I can play in time perfectly, but still be playing live. So with these buttons down the side here, I can choose the rate of my playing. So this is playing straight. And if I push this button here, I can hold it down and it'll trigger perfectly on beat. Or I can do double time. And then I push that button there, and it goes back in time and loops what I just played. I love doing that, you're just like... See, I'm, I literally don't have to be doing anything special, I can just mash the keys. <laughs> yeah, so, that's loop drop. You kind of point. Right, so normally when I talk about, well I give talks about loop drop, I tend to find it very difficult to actually talk about loop drop itself because it's kind of a very large project. Um, I mean, we're sort of condensing five years of, of horror, horrific trauma, no, mostly positive, positive, exciting discovery into like, you know, probably only 10 minutes left now, I don't know. Um, so I thought, Okay, let's just talk about web audio and web MIDI for a start, and then if I have time, I might show you a little bit about how I join web audio and web MIDI up to this user interface, and maybe I'll talk about some of the horrific trouble I've had with JavaScript trying to make you know, uh, an audio application with it. So, 
you may have heard of this thing called the Web Audio API. Like, a lot of people are talking about it, but not that many people are actually using it for anything important. In fact, some people are saying, like, why is this even in the browser? Like, what's the point of this thing? Uh, and I like to think of it, you know, before we had Canvas and SVG, you could only make things that were either like shapes in the browser that were square or circular or maybe like some combination of in between. Before we had rounded, what is it, border radius, you couldn't even do that. You couldn't even do like anything other than squares. If you wanted to do anything with rounded edges, you'd have to render it separately in Photoshop, export all the little pieces, and then match them up with like a combination of divs and fancy tables and all sorts of horrible nonsense. Then if you changed the background color of your website, you'd have to re-render all your divs again, all your little images. It was just a horrible, nasty mess. And so I see these new APIs like Web Audio as being the brow like now that we don't have Flash anymore, woohoo! Um, we've got to have a way of having this control over audio in the same way that we have control over images now with Canvas and SVG. So Without Web Audio, of course, I couldn't even consider making an app like this that uses the browser as its primary base. Anyway, so if you've never seen any Web Audio before, this is some really simple code. Um, you could just paste this straight into your browser and run it, and it would sound like this. So that's a sine wave. I could change it to a lower sine wave, or I could make it a square wave. And it doesn't sound like much at this stage, but if you think about the physics of everything, all sound is really just sine waves. And if you can combine enough sine waves together, you can make any sound. Um, a square wave is actually just a really crazy function of multiple sine waves that does this almost square, but not quite. If you look at that little thing up there, actually, you can't really see it because I turned it down because I didn't want to deafen everyone. But yeah, you can kind of see that it's not quite actually perfectly square, because it's impossible to, to actually create that with the way that speakers move, because there's that little bit of delay between when it goes from that state to that state. Anyway, so that's enough physics. Sorry, I got distracted there. This is going to be the talk. I'm just going to like run off in tangents the whole time. One minute. But anyway, we can get a bit more complicated. We can create an entire sequence with some effects. That's quite nice, and it's only that much code. <laughs> <laughs> and like, OK, what is this? This is some pretty strange code. I mean, you can see some words in there that you recognize, like these ones, my variables, um, and that word there. But, and that's GitHub, sort of, isn't it? <laughs> and that's my name, woohoo! Um, but most of the stuff is like pretty foreign for anyone that's never done any, like, you know, audio programming, or if you, even if you have, you'd be like, what is this? This is a bizarre API. And the reason is, is because Web Audio is not this. It's not a synthesizer. Well, it's not an integrated synthesizer anyway. What it is, is it's a modular synthesizer. So before we had this, this was the only way to synthesize electronic music. And it's still pretty popular with enthusiasts and people that like to waste lots of money, <laughs> is you could have a massive rig that looked like this. Like, it can get crazy. And um, yeah, if you want to watch some fun YouTube videos, just look up modular synthesis, and you'll have like, just weird sounds. And like, it's great. It's wonderful. But the beauty of modular synthesis is that you're not restricted to what the uh, manufacturer decided about how everything should be plugged together. So synthesis is all about generators and processes and then some kind of output. And you might have generators that adjust the inputs of other generators, or that might run like in these crazy like signal chains where signals are just bouncing into other signals and, and you don't like you just start plugging things in and seeing what happens. And it's like as long as you have a really you hand really close to that volume knob, you can just be free to experiment and see what happens. And also obviously you have to have neighbors that tolerate you. Anyway, so I've gone ahead and restructured the code from before to reflect sort of more like this real world example. It's also a lot like guitar pedals or a pedal board, where you have your guitar, which is like the source, it's the generator, and then it runs into a series of like pedals. So that's a really good metaphor for understanding how web audio works. Anyway, so uh, the context, the audio context here, this is like a rack or like a pedal board. You know, it's like the thing where you put all your, your pieces on. So it's 
the equivalent of this device here, the thing that all of these pieces are inside. So once we've got that, we can start putting units into it. So I've put in a, a great big volume knob, so I turned it right down to 0.3, because it's just so loud when you're like doing this raw stuff. Because all this stuff is normalized to like one, so if I just plugged the oscillator straight into the speakers, it would be basically the loudest sound these speakers could possibly produce right now. Well, with the current like, levels. So yeah, we drop that right down. And then I've got an oscillator unit. So this, all an oscillator does is it just flicks between negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, with some kind of interpolation. So I've got it on square at the moment, so it's just going to go straight from negative one to positive one, back to negative one. And we've got a filter. Uh, what that does is it can like cut off the higher frequencies, bring them down, and we've got an LFO. An LFO is just like an oscillator, except that it runs a lot slower. In Web Audio, it's just an oscillator. Um, so I've got these two LFOs. So for a start, I've just connected the oscillator. I've gone, plugged my thing into the oscillator, and then plugged my, the other end of that wire into the speakers. And then when I play it, we hear just like before the square wave. But if I unplug the oscillator from the output and instead plug it into the filter, and then plug the filter into the output. You can hear that the signal has been muffled. And if I adjust the value, so I'm turning the knob on the filter. So you can hear what it's doing there. I can also change it to be high pass, which means that rather than clipping off so rather than letting the high frequencies pass and clipping up, wait, no, I've forgotten. Oh, I'll just do it. <laughs> I, I pretend I know how this stuff works, but I just push buttons until it works. And yeah, there we go. So you can see how that's different, right? It, it's different to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can start getting a bit crazy. And I can connect up these LFOs here. So these are just like another oscillator that's going between like a value of negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1. Then I'm running it through an, uh, an amplifier, bring it up to 400. So this is, if I plug this into the speakers, it'd just be dis distortion and horror. But because I'm plugging this into the frequency, I'm actually plugging it into the filter's frequency knob. So I've actually gone out the output of the, uh, the LFO and then plugged my thing into one of the inputs on my oscillator. And now it can adjust the, the, the frequency of the cutoff. So you hear that. And I can speed it up. Change the values. Uh, and I've got this other LFO connected up to the frequency of the initial square wave that we heard. So this will change the pitch. And I can go absolutely nuts and hook up the first LFO to the second LFO's frequency. And get really weird stuff. <laughs> so this is what happens when like, you're just sitting there plugging things in and, and when you've got the big modular synth. I think it would be a bit more. That's good, yeah. I could just play a whole show doing that, right? <laughs> and in fact, that's actually a genre um, called Algo Rave. And um, this guy here is just like standing on stage, like typing code and live coding. It's great. But I think the reason why it works is because he also has a drummer. And so there's a drummer just playing along with all his synths. So you come a little bit further along in the video, it starts getting pretty rocking. Some of these shots you can actually see a crowd like bobbing in the background, so it is legit, like it's real, okay? But it's not, <laughs> it's not like really what I was into. Because um, I could have just stopped there, you know? I'm like, well, I don't even need like, you know, MIDI controllers or anything. But no, I did. I really wanted to be able to use um, like, you know, buttons and knobs with, with this stuff. And the great thing is, 
The web has an API for that. It's called the web MIDI API. So you might be wondering, like, like what is, what is this MIDI thing? Like, is this those MIDI files, right? Like from back in the day, those horrible low-quality music files that were so great when you were like 10 at school and playing on the computers, but later on you just like cringe. No, that is a file format. This is a protocol. MIDI is a protocol, and it's a protocol that was an implemented. That's been implemented in pretty much every single instrument, every single digital instrument created since 1986 or something like that. So it goes way back. It used to be on these massive big DIN cables, but now we uh, just do it over USB. But it's the same protocol underneath. So we can tap into it like this. So this is just good old-fashioned code that runs in the browser. Um, if I was running this, it would have popped up with a conf confirm dialog. Are you sure you want to give control of all of your music equipment to this web browser, this website? And you would say yes. But as soon as you're connected, I can now in intercept all the messages coming off these controllers. So you can see that the messages are actually really simple. Uh, if you, I don't know, you can see those numbers at the top there. So when I push this one here, you see we've got 144, 11, 127. When I let go, it drops down to zero. Push it again, 127. And as I continue along, it counts up. So we can use this information. We can hook it directly up to our web audio, and we get this. Oops, I've got to run it. So once again, it's pretty like simple code, really. It's actually simpler than the other example because I'm not having to do any sequencing. You know, I'd love to explain what's going on in this code, but like, who cares, right? Like, <laughs> so I've only got a couple more minutes, but I thought I'd just briefly talk about some of the uh, like tricks that I'm using to make loop drop work. Um, so the first and foremost, like I think the important thing to think about if you wanted to structure an app like this is you've got to decide like what is the primary truth of your data? Like where does the state live? So for me, I keep the state in JSON files on my hard drive. Because this is an Electron app, which you're going to hear all about in the next talk, I think. Um, I can actually just access the file system. So I just like load up the folder that the user gives me, the project folder, and I look for a file. Oh yeah, that was going to make a joke. <laughs> And I load up this file called project.json, and it contains everything I need to know about like getting this project started, the, the zoom level, the tempo, the swing, all that kind of nonsense. Um, and then I can, and then it, so project.json specifies that this type, of, this type is a project. And so when Loop Drop opens this file, it's going to look for something that can render a project or something that can handle the, the file format a project. And then that thing specifies it wants setups, and so then it lists all of, the, all of these files down the side here. Um, and if you look at this, it's just, you know, this is, this is really complicated and confusing. But the point is, is that everything is off the, the JSON, and I'm observing the JSON object. Whenever it changes, I update my interface. Whenever I make changes in the interface, I um, reflect those in the, in the app. So um, I was, was going to make another joke about like, how crazy complicated all this stuff is. But since I've, I'm pretty much going to wrap up now, I won't. Just trust me, it's terrible. I am, by the way, this is going to be always your biggest problem when you're building an app like this, is just there's a lot to think about. Garbage collection in JavaScript is a massive pain. And so what I've had to do is basically rewrite all the libraries myself. Like if I was using React or like Virtual DOM or something, no, nope, it's gone. Um, and so I've built some abstractions myself into this library called Mutant, which gives me all the nice reactive FRP style, but without all the overhead of immutable structures and garbage collection. So that really helps a lot. Um, yeah, why would I even bother? Ah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why not? Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, like basically what I do now is I play JavaScript events. Uh, I play music for the after parties. One day I'm actually going to be a real DJ and play clubs, but like, what's the, like where's the fun in that? So this was at JSConf Singapore back in November. Um, so the, the lighting, the visuals, and the sound are all being produced with JavaScript. And it was a rockin' good time. Come on, play.
This is not uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, whatever. Anyway, you get the point. It was great. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. That was uh, enlightening and uh, scary as well. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, uh, we've got a, bit, a few minutes just to take some questions off people. Just put up your hand uh, and we'll bring a mic to you. Just make sure you ask a question into the mic. Hi. Hey. Um, I was just wondering, um, so obviously it's very cool to be using JavaScript. Do you use <coughs> Explore with any other, like, um, audio programming languages, things like uh, Chuck or um, I can't remember the other one at the moment. So, um, what was the first one you said? Um, so, why why JavaScript right. over <coughs> like more established <coughs> audio programming languages? Yes, that is a very good question, and hopefully, <coughs> I'll be able to survive um, the, the answer. <laughs> I wish I just left you hanging like that. That was just it. <laughs> Right, I'm over it now. OK. Yeah, so why JavaScript? Um, well, the simple answer is uh, because that was the language I knew at the time when I was starting to fiddle with the stuff. I did try using some Python uh, back in the early days when I first started experimenting. So originally, I was just doing MIDI stuff. So I was intercepting the data coming out of these launch pads, running into Node.js or whatever, and then, and then putting it into like Ableton Live or you know, something like that. And that did work pretty well. But, um, so I, was, I tried Python, I tried a few other languages. But I ended up settling on Node because it was just so, so good for this kind of thing, because you get the asynchronous events. And it means you don't have to worry about like, loops and stuff. You can, just, like, you can just react to the events. Um, and I'm sure there's far better languages for doing this. But like, I, the second thing I tried was JavaScript, and it worked. And then there was Web Audio, and I'm like, well, this just makes sense. And that's really the answer. I haven't really tried anything else. <laughs> Uh, do you have any particular future plans, like things that you're trying to build now or things you want to work on? Uh, yeah, so what I was going to talk about at the very end of the talk, um, yeah, so performance. I've basically got a massive problem. So look at this video here. Everyone, if it loads, everyone in the audience is having a great time. They are they're dancing, partying. <laughs> And then, <laughs> did you see the way the crowd just went, oh, like, you can't do that to people. And so anyway, what I'm, what I'm planning on working on is really just focusing on actually making it really solid. And I probably have to do some nasty hacks. I might even have to move away from web audio, potentially. But we'll see. Does that answer the question? Um, how do you feel about Sonic Pi and what people have been doing with that with live streaming performances? Um, so Sonic Pi, is that a live coding environment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's for Ruby. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that sort of stuff's really exciting and pretty cool. Um, it's interesting how it's like a whole new genre of music. Like I've shown you the algo rave stuff before. Um, and because the tools that people use really do change the, like, what you hear. The aesthetic of music is, I think, the best, most interesting music comes from some kind of interesting place where you can actually kind of hear how this music's been created. And so music that's created with live coding has that sound. And it can be quite hard at first when you're listening to it. But I think it's definitely something like, if, you're, if you are a developer or a coder and you're at a, a gig and someone's like live coding, you can follow along in your head. Or even if you're not, like, it's the sort of thing that actually really gets you into coding. You're like, wow, this is a whole new world of stuff I've never even considered before. So, does that answer? <laughs> cool. I think that's all the time we've got for, uh, for this session. Uh, so thanks again to Matt. That was absolutely awesome. Thank you.